Well, let's have some more. They'd have paid more money than they did for Pat Cummins and Ben Stokes and all those guys put together to get Vivian Richards in their lineup because they'd have put bums on seats. So if a keeper can bat, great. But I think certainly in the subcontinent where keeping is, is tough because the ball is doing all kinds of things, I'd always go with my primary keeper. But if you get a side around Virat Kohli that performs on a regular basis, India will hold up a lot of trophies. Hello and welcome to this week's Cricket Inside Out. We have plenty on the menu. We are going to be discussing whether cricket should allow tactical subs. Uh, crunch some numbers, take a look at the stats around wicket keepers and figure out whether we think that we're going to still see specialist wicket keepers in the years to come. We've got plenty of burning questions from you, which I'm super excited about. And we are also, of course, taking all of a moment for one of the greats of the game. Maybe you can get who it is already. Let's welcome our guests on this week's episode from the land of the long white cloud where they seem to have also beaten COVID already. Ahead of the curve much, Ian Smith? Hi, Elma. Yeah, uh, really pleased to be with you guys and the, the cricketing world, of course. And yeah, we're, we're getting close to say that um, we've beaten it. We can't get too complacent about the whole thing. But I, I, think, I think we're on the right track. We're a small country. And of course, we're, we've got no land around us. We, we can lock ourselves down quite easily. But uh, at this stage, it's uh, fingers crossed that uh, we can get back to some sort of normality and maybe some stage of live cricket. That would be good. That would be good. Harsha Bagley, thank you so much for joining us. How are things in India? Well, if you've got me up against a proper cricketing heavyweight, Emma, so I've got to be a little careful today with Smithy. We go back, uh, we go back some distance. Now, we are taking a moment since uh, what we're all doing at this stage is watching back some of our favourite cricketing memories and certainly one of the best in the business in, in terms of great memories. Our Hall of Fame feature for today, returning our gaze to Sir Viv Richards, probably one of the hardest hitting batsmen of the modern era, one of the finest all-round fielders of his time. Um, and he just had such a regal appearance at the crease. A man with real presence. Now, um, he was inducted in the ICC Hall of Fame in 2009. And next Sunday is the 36th anniversary of that phenomenal ODI knock, probably one of the best of all time, uh, versus England at Lords 1984. Um, Harsha, let's start maybe with you. What motivated mm. Viv Richards? Because he just seemed to have such ease. It, it just seemed to come so naturally to him. Was motivation important? I think with Sir Viv, God said, go own the cricket ground. And he said, I will obey thee and went and owned the cricket ground. I mean, Smithy had a, had a ringside view sometimes. He was just behind. But anyone, anyone who saw Viv Richards in his prime was came away saying, wow, anybody who didn't has no idea what they missed. Yeah, his ODI strike rates were insane. Uh, we worked up the numbers of the most prolific ODI batsmen during his career. Alan Border was at 70.39. He was second to Viv Richard Serviv, 90.2. <laughs> there is almost not a stat that doesn't reflect favorably. Smithy, uh, tell us about the man and competing against him. Well, I remember uh, Viv Richards going back to 75 and 79. Of course, his career spanned about 18 years of international cricket at the highest possible level. He didn't he didn't uh, ease his way in. He started it in a pretty emphatic fashion. But his performances in the 1975 and 1979 World Cups, when it was just getting underway, uh, were quite phenomenal with in the field and with the bat. I remember him um, personally because as an opponent, I don't think I've ever in the time I played or in the time I've commentated cricket seen a more imposing batsman come to the crease. And, and I, I talk about his presence. There have been some really fine players uh, who, have, who have looked like that uh, they're very confident when they come to the crease and they own the situation. But no man, I think, has been imposing to the point where uh, I think opposition attacks and, and fieldsmen were a little bit intimidated by him. Vivian Richards used to come out. He never wore a helmet. He had that beautiful West Indian uh, maroon cap just slightly to the side. Rastafarian armbands, a bat that looks like a toothpick in his hand, and he would come to the wicket, he'd be already sweating. Um, and, and his nickname back in those days was Smokey. 
uh, like smoking Joe Frazier. He was just like ready to fight and take you on. And it was intimidating. And he's one of the guys I used to stand behind and think, I've got to so concentrate on what I'm going to do because he might offer me a chance, but I can't be carried away with his presence or what he's got to do. I've got to think about my job because if I let him go, if I have that opportunity and I miss it, we're going to pay dearly and pay tenfold. So he was a really great competitor, a hard man. Uh, I played against him when he first became the captain of the West Indies and and he took over from Sir Clive Lloyd. Uh, and that was a great um, pressure on him to perform that role and take it over with a fine side. Um, but I, I remember Vivian Richards as a prize fighter with a bat in his hand. He, he was amazing, simply amazing. And and I think what's what's remarkable about him because we tend to look at his as at his stats as a batsman, um, but his fielding um, generally was also something that he was really known for. And in that, he just seemed like an absolute athlete. Um, Harsha, is it maybe a stretch to say that he seemed yeah. like someone who could probably do well at any sport? And I'll tell you what, he got 150 wickets because I think people thought they were so tired of facing the four fast bowlers, they'd take a chance. But you know, he first came to India as a very young man. I was, I was even younger, I was watching as a kid. 1974, he took a catch that the people in Bangalore who are old enough still talk about uh, when he palmed one ball from Gauskar at short leg and then dived backwards to hold that 75 World Cup final, three direct hits. I think that's what Smithy was referring to. Sometimes when someone is so good at something, so incandescent as Viv was, then you tend to forget the other skills too. But Jay, he, he, he had a presence. I've spoken to a few bowlers who said, you know what, the world was fine till we came out to bat. For someone who um, maybe, uh, you know, is a young cricket fan now, what should they look out for? When you watch back um, the innings that he played and, and the matches that Sir Viv played in, Smithy, if, if someone is only now getting introduced to him, what is it that, um, that you really need to look for in his, in his style of play and his skill level? Well, I'd like to say that you could look at one shot in particular that defines him, but he, he had every shot. Uh, he was fantastic when they took him on. He had no fear about playing short pitch bowling. Um, he, he had, I thought, one of the most amazing shots he used to play was he used to toy with mid-on, and the great players hit the ball straight so easily. And he used to toy with mid-on. He would hit to the left of mid-on, hit to the right of mid-on, with so much ease and so much timing that it was almost a, a joke, really. And, and that was, I think, the shot that you bowl a, a relatively good delivery, quite straight, around about middle and off, and um, you'd find mid-on would be chasing it to the boundary more often than not. He, he was just so good at that. What I would say, um, if any young cricketer can find any footage of Sir Vivian Richards, uh, is just control. It's confidence and control for me. Back yourself, back your naturally given ability. And, and God gave him some real, real talent. There's no doubt about that. But he used it. Uh, God gives us all a lot of talent, but sometimes we don't use it. Vivian Richard used it and, and he, he made it even better. So that would be my advice is, is just you don't have to be um, a flamboyant type player, but you back yourself to to do well in most situations. So. When you got Vivian Richards out uh, playing against them, you felt like that you were going, you were going uh, deep into the West Indies batting lineup, which was huge. So I, I, I just thought he was the prize wicket every time we played against. Him. Tell you what, you talked about what should a young man learn. I saw a young man awestruck, wide-eyed, interviewing Viv Richards last year. Except his name was Virat Kohli. And he was sitting like this, you know, like 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 a little child, hanging on to every word that Viv was speaking. And I think even at this age, that aura for one of the modern greats to me was was a great sight. Yeah, he does have a an aura about him. That's certainly true. Do you think he was perhaps born in the wrong era? Imagine what he could have done in T Twenty cricket, or is is that impossible to say, considering how much cricket has moved? It's tough to compare apples with oranges, harsher, isn't it? You know, you, you can't do that sort of thing. And, and one of the hardest things in cricket in particular is to say someone in the 50s is, is better than someone in, in the, uh, you know, the 90s or the 2000s. What I will say is this. I believe that Vivian Richards would have made a go at cricket in any form in any decade. 
That's why. Um, you look at his strike rate, um, which was so superior to anyone else's at that time. That is a T20 strike rate without ha- without even having that game in his mind. He would have been a absolute, an absolute legend in T20 cricket. He would have bought, they'd have paid more money than they did for Pat Cummins and Ben Stokes and all those guys put together uh, to get Vivian Richards in their lineup because he'd have put bums on seats. Um, he would have been an absolute crowd pleaser and television rights would have gone through the roof. That for me is how good he was. And, and, and I'll sum it up, uh, Elmer, by saying that whenever you sit down and pick your all time world 11, your all time world 11, um, he's always in mind, I promise you. And from one of cricket's greats to a question around its stats particularly and data and whether the fact that this is hard to measure will mean that it will be relegated to the past. We are talking about test keepers, specialist wicket keepers. Now, the collecting of data on catches and stumpings is a really tricky and generally considered to be subjective thing because there's no measurements. It sometimes seems hard to justify whether you have a wicket keeper, a specialist one, um, and whether you want that over someone who can contribute with the bat. Are specialist test keepers a thing of the past, Smithy? Yeah, specialist glove men who uh, that is their absolute number one skill are, I think, a thing of the past. Um, and I was part of that bracket of guys who were picked on their ability to to, uh, to wear the gloves and wear, to, wear them well. So that, that was my stock and trade. And then runs on top of that were pretty much a bonus. Adam Gilchrist changed it to a large degree. Um, he, he made it very hard for uh, wicket keepers um, to not score runs. No one was ever going to be quite like Gilchrist, although there's some that have, have gone close to him since he was around. But uh, you, you must now um, be able to, to bat. And I mean, by that, I think you've got to average well into the 30s at a relatively good strike rate. Um, but you've got to weigh that up, Elmer. It's a really interesting topic because I might score 40, average 40 or 35 to 40 as... Uh, as a wicket keeper, um, and that's fantastic. But if I drop Virat Kohli, and if I drop Rohit Sharma, and if I miss out on on getting David Warner early on because my skills aren't good enough with the gloves, is my 40 runs worth that? I don't know, because they might go on to score a lot more. You're right. It, it, it's pretty much the thing of the past. You are expected now um, to be almost duly skilled. Duly skilled, equally skilled in both, which um, I think is a bit of a shame in the end because at the end, I thought the silkiness of the great wicket keepers, um, I thought was something to behold, really. Harsha, um, a lot of people mention Gilchrist, mm. but is it not perhaps something that would have uh, been a necessary consequence of professional cricket? At some point, someone was probably going to change the game in this way, if not him, then the next person. Look, look at how cricket used to be played, Elmer. You had six batsmen whose job was to score the runs. You had a keeper whose job was to make the bowlers look good and be smart and clean. And you had four bowlers whose job was to take wickets. And it, it, it was a specialised function. At the moment, we want, as, as Smithy said, the keeper to do two things. But the expectations from the keeper have risen. Now, look in the last 10 years itself, even post Gilchrist, there's been a bit of Sangakara, there's been Bairstow, there's been Butler, there's been Quinton Dacock, Mushfiqur Rahim, uh, BJ Watling. You've had some really quality batsmen keeping wickets. Uh, I think in T20 cricket, it really doesn't matter. You've got, you get hardly 10 balls going behind the stump, so it doesn't matter. In, in one-day cricket, maybe to a lesser extent. But in Test match cricket, I'm going entirely with Smithy, even if that surprises the daylights out of him, that you need your keeper first. And we had that same issue, Smithy. You'd know that when India were in New Zealand recently, one of the best mm. keepers India's ever produced in Ridhiman Saha, in Sri Lanka, on a complete turner, we almost gave him man of the match for his keeping alone. He was sensational, did not let one ball go through when one was scooting and one was jumping. But because his batting average was 30 in an era of when wicket keepers averaged 33, they preferred Risha Pant over him. Uh, Pant, presumably the better batsman, but no comparison as a keeper. So, I, I mean, times are changing. I was looking at Smithy's numbers actually, Elma. Smithy averaged 
as a, as a batsman in test cricket at a time when, when the acceptable average was 23. So even he was punching above his weight uh, as a batsman in that era. So if a keeper can bat, great. But I think certainly in the subcontinent where keeping is, is tough because the ball is doing all kinds of things, I'd always go with my primary keeper. Mm. So is it is it perhaps something that just depends on the kind of attack you're employing, the kind of pitch you're playing on? Yeah, it can do. I mean, it depends where you're playing a lot. Huh? I mean, you need to, in, in a place like India, for instance, you need a guy who's so good up to the stumps. He's going to spend majority of his time keeping up at the stumps. In New Zealand, you're looking at a country which produces conditions where spin bowling is not really fostered. Um, so you need a guy who can stand back, um, occasionally stand up to the stumps, but predominantly he's going to spend three quarters of his day standing back, which is the easiest part of the wicket keeping job, without doubt. Uh, but in that particular case, that's why BJ Watling from New Zealand has become such a great asset, because he does his job efficiently, uh, better than adequate, he's efficient, uh, his, his catching rate is very high, but his runs are unbelievably good. His runs are unbelievably good. And that is why he is such a key member of the New Zealand side. And I'll say right now, day in, day out, probably in the top two or three wicketkeeper batsmen in the world, maybe even a bit higher than that. England is the most amazing situation for me, Harsha, because you've got two wicketkeepers and Butler and you, you've also got Bairstow. They both play pretty much in all forms of the game, but they share the gloves. and. I can't mm. quite get to the bottom of how that works in terms of selection. Surely one of them is better than the other, or are they that that equal in skills that it doesn't matter? I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you, but I think Smithy Elmer makes a really good point. Everyone says Adam Gilchrist changed the way you look at keepers, but hang on, Gilchrist was a good keeper. Just because Gilchrist mm. followed Ian Healy, you tended to say, oh, He's only Gilchrist. Gilchrist would have made every other team in world cricket at that time. So, just as Watling, Gilchrist, they're all very good keepers. That their bat is excellent, but they're not letting the side down behind the stumps. You can't have a keeper who's letting the side down behind the stumps because he's scoring runs. And Smithy, to compound that issue with England, they went to Sri Lanka some time back and they picked up a third keeper who scored 100 in Ben Folks. Let's take a look at the questions you have contributed to the show this week. Um, thank you so much for everyone engaging on social media with us. Every week when we put the call out, uh, you surprise and impress. Uh, MM Ready S2020 on Twitter asks, do you guys think India um, have a jinx on them for winning ICC trophies under Virat Kohli's captaincy. Uh, he says they've, they've covered all the bases for the last couple of years, but they're just failing at crucial times. Do they need to reinstate Dhoni at the helm? And Hasha, please take this one for us. Well, for a start, Dhoni hasn't played cricket since, uh, since that semi-final against New Zealand. So, we, we don't even know if he's fit, though uh, the word was that when he turned up for the first practice sessions for Chennai Super Kings, before the IPL was called off, uh, well, called off for now, he was fit and he was looking in tremendous nick, apparently. But, but this lockdown is affecting him, so we don't even know if he's available for a start and if he is uh, mainly for T20 cricket. But uh, look, it's, it's, it's been an old issue. Uh, un under Dhoni, India lost the 2015 World Cup semi-final as well to Australia. India lost in 2016. Uh, actually, since Dhoni delivered 2007, 2011 and the Champions Trophy 2013, India haven't won anything. I'm not sure it's because of captain. It's because on the big day, the top three don't score runs. And you see people like New Zealand just find a Henry or someone like that to come and knock them over on the big day. So I, I think the issue is that India have one, two, three, but not as good four and five. And, and that's the bigger reason than who's captain. Do you agree, Smithy? Yeah, look, I, I, I've got an immense admiration for both the players you're talking about. Uh, I think um, MS Dhoni has been one of the great modern day players uh, of uh, this century in particular with his influence on, on cricket in India but, and cricket around the world and his respect is great. But I, I also um, have this thing uh, about Virat Kohli, where I think he's a player of a generation. Um, so, you know, they're, they're both very good leaders. They both lead from the front. But uh, look, Kohli will win titles. There's no doubt about it. You wouldn't replace Virat Kohli as captain, not now. 
Uh, he will win titles, he, but he just needs players around him uh, to front up. He's not going to score runs every day. He's not going to be the hero every day. The cricket's not like that. But if you get a side around Virat Kohli that performs on a regular basis, India will hold up a lot of trophies. Arkady Pal on Twitter wants to know if you guys think T10 is the ideal format to introduce cricket at the Olympics. If we're taking cricket to the Olympic Games, shall we just, you know, do something crazy like a T10? Or shall we give the people an established format? Uh, first of all, I don't even know if everybody if, if T10 is an established format yet, because you could, go, you could go T8, you could go T5. But I think there's something in the Olympic Charter anyway that says you must have an established format. You can't have a 20-minute football game, for example, as part of the Olympics. So as of now, T10 is a bit like a 20-minute football match. We've just experimented with it. So as of now, the format that you could go to the Olympics with is, is T20. Does cricket need the Olympics to be accepted widely around the world? Well, you already got 100 plus uh, teams playing uh, uh, pl playing cricket. Is the US going to uh, accept cricket? Is China going to accept cricket? We don't know really. So at, at the moment, I'm not sure everyone's too hot on cricket going to the Olympics. But if it does at the moment, it's got to be T20. We've only seen it once in a multi-sport uh, discipline when we had it in the Commonwealth Games in 98. Uh, or 50 hours is too long. But uh, may maybe 20 hours, I'm not sure T10 yet because the Olympics won't accept T10 unless there's an international T10 tournament. Smithy, you also work on a lot of rugby. We've seen what Sevens Rugby has done as an Olympic sport. Would you take T10 to the Olympics or do you think there's space there for perhaps a T20? No, I'm going to give you a long, um, drawn out answer on this one, Elmo, which is probably going to send you to sleep. So uh, the answer for me <laughs> is no. Kastav Dasgupta is a prolific tweeter of questions. He asks, Ian, since you often batted with the highest strike rate during Test and ODI matches, do you think you would have been a star in T20 cricket if it was played a little earlier? Yeah, I reckon I'd be worth about 1.8 million US, to be fair, Elmer. Um, I, 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 I look, I, I, I'm just a... <laughs> I just love to be able to commentate on it, to be fair, let alone playing it. But the, uh, this, um, I, I'd have enjoyed it. I don't know how successful I'd have been. I think that'll work me out. I think that'll work me out pretty quickly uh, because they're very clever these days in terms of shutting batsmen down. And I'm not sure I would have had the skills to get around it. I'd have loved to have had a crack at it. Um, I'm not sure I'd have been as good as or as effective as Brendan McCullum, even though I taught him everything he knows. Uh, but I, I just think that. Um, <laughs> I think I'd have been a middle of the road player and, and a slightly undesirable because most of the franchises don't waste their money on wicket keepers and, and that sort of thing. So I'm happy to watch it. I'm happy to watch it and be poor. Classic, classic I'll tell you Kiwi about humbleness right here. I'll, I'll t well, the Smithy came from an era when they were not quite as, as humble. They had a few things to say. But I'll tell you a thing or two about Smithy's strike rates. I've been looking up his numbers, right? I've got his numbers here. Test cricket, strike rate 63, but ODI strike rate 99. I think he'll be in a 150-160 strike rate T20 player and you would have gone up and opened the batting and tried to hit the, uh, red ball, the white ball as far as possible. Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, it's, it's, just, it's just sad that, you know, um, I live in a small shack over here in New Zealand and just dream about a beach house and a boat. And being able to go fishing, Harsha, I just, it's, I'm just a, a, a two decades too late. I'm sorry. And we move on to cricket should allow tactical subs. So this is an interesting one to take on. Harsha Bogley, let's uh, open the floor with your stance. Do you agree or do you disagree? Should we, for example, name a 14 player squad for a match and then allow? one of the three to be used during the game at some point, at a tactical uh, moment? Look, I didn't mind. In fact, I quite like the use of the super sub in ODI cricket because in ODI cricket, it was becoming a little too one-sided towards the batsman and any format of the game that allows the best batsman up against the best bowlers is always something to be welcomed. So if you knocked a batsman off, brought an extra bowler in and say you had five proper bowlers bowling at seven proper batsmen, then you got a better game. But I don't like that in T20 because in T20, you've someone might just come in and bowl in over here and there and you've often got enough. 
and I definitely don't like it in test match cricket because test match cricket encompasses so much, isn't it? The ability to fight back, you're not good enough and yet you've got to hang in there, there's resilience, there's tenacity, there's all these words in, you've got to make good the resources that you have. You, you suddenly got people popping in, bowling, bowling a spell before lunch, going back. Someone else comes in like rolling substitutes in hockey, and hockey for example. So I'm not a great fan of it in, in, in test match cricket. I can understand a concussion substitute. I hope we never get a COVID substitute situation. Uh, but a medical substitute, I can understand. But I, I, I think teams must learn to play with what they have. It's like, it's like families that must learn to live within their means. Uh, cricket teams must learn to play with what they have. So in, in test match cricket, not a good idea. I love one super sub in ODIs and I don't think T20 needs it. Thank you so much um, to Harsha and to Smithy joining us for another episode of Cricket Inside Out. And uh, we love having you join the party. Make sure you continue, continue the conversation online. For us this week, it's goodbye.